Our guest has served, uh, uh, I think, with uh, given the fact that uh, that the party opposite has been in control of, uh, of the House of Representatives. But I think he served with uh, with great with great effectiveness. And uh, he's a stand-up guy. He's impatient with the Congress. He's impatient with his own political party. And I think he'll share some of those thoughts and ideas with us today. Welcome, please, from the 51st Congressional District from the United States House of Representatives, a very special friend, the Honorable Bob Filner. Uh, thank you, George. I've reached the pinnacle of success. I have been introduced by George Mitrovich. So, uh, and I bring you regards from the rest of the rest of the country. Uh, for George, the rest of the country is Joe Biden. So uh, I bring you uh, everybody else. And I want to thank, uh, I want to thank uh, both Georges for their, uh, for their leadership, the Catfish Club and the, uh, and the City Club. Both clubs, I think, have, uh, have, uh, really heightened the civic understanding and the, and the level of debate in our community. And uh, I call them both my curious Georges because uh, they're both interested in what's going on in the world around it and try to uh, d you know, share that enthusiasm, that curiosity with you and get people to try to figure out what's going on around them because we all should play a role. This is uh, a great democracy if people utilize it. Uh, they have to utilize it. And the cynicism that George mentioned prevents people. People think they have no role anymore, that special interests dominate what's the use of being, uh, of being uh, participants. And I'll try to say there is some use. I mean, I've seen it in my own life. Uh, when I was uh, a college student, I participated, like, as some, I know some people in this room with, in the early uh, civil rights movement. Uh, and those of us who, uh, who uh, rode buses and went to jail, we changed American history. I mean, we didn't make life perfect in America, but we changed American history, and that came because we got involved. And uh, that's, that optimism has stayed with me from a student all the way through the, even at this, what I consider very uh, tragic times, not only in our city, but in the federal government. Let me say uh, uh, something a general, and then I'm going to rip into both parties, okay? <laughs> you, it's no secret which one I am, do you? Uh, the, the uh, political life today, uh, and um, a lot of the cynicism that, uh, that comes from the political life today, uh, especially in the, in the national legislature, I think comes from the fact that the system seems fixed for most people. How do you change these people who always are getting elected, they got so much money, the districts seem to be uh, fixed for a certain political party? Uh, and in fact, when you look at the statistics in the United States Congress, in the last couple decades, we have had a 98.6% re-election rate. <laughs> That's higher than the Soviet Union ever had with its uh, one-party state. <laughs> I mean, even the Soviet Union allowed 3% non-communists to take over. We are better than they are uh, because uh, of two things. The districts are gerrymandered by the state legislatures in the interests of the incumbents. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat. And it costs so much money to run for office, the incumbents are very difficult to throw out. Uh, I mean, even a wild-eyed guy like me, you have difficulty throwing it out if, they, if people wanted to because uh, of the way the, uh, the gerrymandering has taken place and the, uh, the amount of money. I have to raise, just for a primary election coming up, $2 million. Now, that's $40,000 every week for a year. Forget any corruption about why people might give that money. Anybody here want to buy my house, by the way? No, that's just, uh, f forget, forget that corruption for a second. The mere time involved in raising that kind of money is corrupting. I should be worried about health care and education and job creation. And I got to raise money for the election. I mean, that's the rules. And I believe we should not only, uh, we should have a public financing of these elections. I would like to get all the private money out. <laughs> a, a lot of people say, hey, you know, you're stealing my money while you're in my office. Now you want the money, me, me to pay for running for you? But people are getting screwed the way it is, I'll tell you. Only a few people basically fund campaigns. And those people then have access and then have uh, the influence that uh, we say should not happen in a democracy. 
Uh, I also, uh, well, you'll find it strange, but I believe what uh, the governor of our state is doing with regard to the redistricting. I'm not sure he has the right mechanism, but I think we should get redistricting out of the partisan situation. Uh, again, every seat is made safe for every incumbent in virtually every state in America. In Congress, it's 435 members, maybe 30, maybe 30 are even considered competitive. What kind of democracy is that? So uh, I think the state should have independent means of redistricting. Uh, I think that would make competition better it, and it would lead to accountability. Right now in the Congress, very few people feel they have to be truly accountable because they're safely ensconced. I mean, unless you do something really stupid like, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 you got to do something really stupid to uh, not to be able to get reelected in this system. So uh, keep that in mind as I talk about each party in that the accountability that comes from the amount of money that's required and the uh, and the uh, the gerrymandering that has taken place makes it very difficult for anybody to lose their office. And that leads to uh, accountability. I mean, that's the basis for democracy. Uh, we say in, uh, in your, in your uh, textbooks when you study political science, people choose their representatives. But with redistricting, it's the representatives who choose their people. And they, we could, with, especially with computers, but you could, do it any, uh, you could do it without computers, you could very, very technically, uh, very, very down to the block or to the, even that house fix how many Democrats and Republicans and what kind they are in your district. So just keep that in mind. Now, my, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat. I uh, have great difficulties with what the Republicans are doing today. Uh, they have, uh, I think Mr. Bush has successfully realized the dream of Ronald Reagan. And that dream was to put as much as possible of your nation's resources into defense and war and September 11th has provided a very a tragic but convenient excuse for the president to keep that fear going, to keep money into, uh, into defense, and of course, into the war in Iraq. Uh, right now, by the way, we are spending every two and a half to three days a billion dollars in Iraq. A billion, every couple days. Now, you can't imagine what kind of money that is. I mean, nobody can figure out. I mean, in the federal government, we deal with these billions as if it was decimal dust, you know? But when a country chooses to spend that kind of money on one thing, whatever it is, there's no money left for other things. You know it in your regular budget. You know it in your business budget. If you spend too much money on one, you don't have anything to spend on the other. So again, the first equation of what Ronald, uh, Reagan did and what Bush has so successfully done, put everything into war. You make sure your income is, uh, is greatly reduced by giving tax cuts to the wealthiest amongst us. Uh, the tax policies of this administration have, uh, have uh, I think, really hurt the middle and working cl class people in this nation. Uh, if you're a millionaire, you know, like Mitrovich over here, uh, you get about a $100,000 check back from the government. I mean, that's five times what people in my district make on an average. Uh, the average person uh, is not getting reduced taxes, they're paying more taxes, and I'll try to show that in a second. So if you uh, spend everything on war and you don't have any money coming in because of tax policies, when someone says, how about education? How about housing? How about environmental protection? How about our veterans? Sorry, no money. We gotta balance the budget. And they're balancing the budget on the backs of the middle class of this country. I mean, what is going on is, is truly rolling back in a whole number of ways everything that many people in this room fought for for the last 50, 60 years. And it's gonna take us a long time to dig out of it, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so in a, in, with a uh, party that prides itself on fiscal discipline, we got almost a $400 billion deficit this year. We went from a projected two and a half trillion surplus when Clinton left to a seven and a half trillion dollar debt right now. These are the fiscal conservatives. But when it comes to, to the war, when it comes to tax breaks, we don't have to be fiscally responsible. When it comes to education and health care and veterans, yes. Uh-oh, we gotta stop that spending. You guys wanna spend too much. 
And within that starving of the public sector, I'll say, they, they move forward a central part of their agenda, which is privatize the world. Everything should be privatized that is left to the private sector. And the public sector has no, we should not get as many resources because it just means people, in their view, who are intellectually, morally, and any way, every other way inferior, why should tax monies go to people who don't have jobs or need an education or need health care? If they were, if they were religious enough and moral enough and smart enough, they would have that. So the public sector, which for me is just all of us doing things together, what we can't do separately. I mean, nobody, you can't build a road and each person take a piece of road in front of their house, right? You, you have the government collecting some money from each of us and we build a decent road because that's, we can't do it separately. And on and on and on. Uh, the public sector though, because it serves people who the Republicans don't really want to care about because they're not in their districts. They redistricted them out. What do we care about them, those people? We're privatizing education. The, uh, we passed a uh, uh, voucher system for uh, District of Columbia, which gives parents the right to go to private schools. The so-called No Child Left Behind Act is designed to undermine public education. It allows people to take money from the federal treasury to go to a private school. That undermines public education. Social Security, you know, their privatization. They may not get that far, but they're trying to do it. Medicare, in, in the, uh, they went further than this. They never thought they, got, they went because the, uh, the Democrats couldn't fight back sufficiently. We passed this so-called prescription drug bill, which not only was a fraud on its own case, but to get any of the benefits from that, you have to leave Medicare. You have to join a private HMO. Most people don't know that. I see some incredulous looks, but when you read the legislation, you cannot get the catastrophic coverage unless you do it through an HMO. So we, they, they want to privatize that. They want to privatize the air traffic control people. Uh, I, I like to say that if they could, they would have the mad cows themselves inspecting for agricultural problems. <laughs> I mean, they want the people to inspect who, you know, who actually have the problems, whether it's environment or any, anything else. So we're narrowing the public sector, we're starving it for resources, and we get back, finally, to the world that they see. It's a law of the jungle. The fittest survive. And if you haven't survived, tough. Now, I think that I and most and Democrats believe we're all in this together, that we bring each other up together, that, you know, in, in, in simplistic, if one person is sick, then we're all, the society is not healthy, and if one person is uneducated, we're all going to suffer. And we say, yet, yeah, let everybody have the American dream. Not that everybody is equal, but everybody ought to have the opportunity. And that principle is just, is anathema to the, uh, the, the governing majority in the Congress, House, Senate, the President, and the Supreme Court. So what are the Democrats doing about this? I mean, it seems clear to me that this is, uh, these are policies that, that, that go against the whole fiber of American life for the last century, maybe, taking away all the gains that we made in environments, uh, the kind of mutual support systems that have been built up in, uh, in, uh, with, through Social Security and Medicare. And uh, uh, the Democrats should be having a ball at this time. I mean, we should be getting converts everywhere and, and ready to take elections. I don't see that happening. <laughs> Most people, I, I was just listening to some of the commentary as I drove here this, this afternoon, and uh, where are the Democrats? They keep saying, where are the Democrats? Uh, what is their positive vision of what's going on? Do we have any uh, way to, uh, to deal with these issues? Uh, I think we do as a party and as many individuals. There's a lot of uh, great people actually in both parties. But as a group, the Democrats don't seem to be able to deal with this. Let me just give you some examples of what I mean by that. Gas prices. I mean, country sh the country should be, is ready for revolution as they see these gas prices. Uh, do the Democrats have an answer to it? I don't know. I mean, I don't see it. I have an answer, but I don't see our party having an answer for it. Uh, clearly, by the way, uh, 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 Umberto reminds me to tell a little story here. Um, 
you know the story about when you want to kill a frog, if you put it in uh, boiling water, what happens? He just jumps out. I mean, he's just, you know, it's just too much of a shock and he jumps out so you can't kill him. But if you put him in tepid water, he's smiling, he's smiling, he's, you know, he's swimming around, floating on his back with a smile. You slowly, slowly turn up the temperature. You kill him with a smile on his face. We're the frogs. <laughs> And the multinational oil companies, or the pharmaceutical companies, or the insurance companies, or the electricity companies, as we saw in our electricity crisis a few years ago, they ratchet, thing, ratchet things up, uh, and if they get too high, we jump out, so they move it back, and we get used to the new warmth, and, you know, and they're killing us as they keep ratcheting everything up. You would die now for $2.25 gas, right? <laughs> but $2.25 a year ago was out of the question. They've, they've got us moved up to where we accept the 225 and the 250. Now we're happy at 275. This is not a, call, this is not a supply and demand issue. This is not a supply and demand issue, or it's very minor. It's about control of the market by a few multinational companies. They, 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 they uh, drill for the oil, they refine it in gasoline, and they sell it through, the, through uh, gas stations. Something like two-thirds or almost over 70 percent of gas stations are now owned by these multinationals. We can go after these guys. There was an article, I think, in the New York Times this morning that said, people think we can't go after these gasolines, the, ga uh, the gas prices. We can. I have legislation that not only got, says, let's, let's uh, investigate him for uh, antitrust action, which they are guilty of, but uh, does things like uh, windfall profits tax at 100%. I mean, there are things we could do, and we could talk about the policy. We are not impotent in the face of this as a people. But Congress has been bought off, both parties, by the oil companies. and. The public doesn't seem to, to know that it has a role to play here. Prescription drug. I call that, by the way, every time you go to fill up your gas tank, you should think Bush tax. Because it's a tax on you by the policies, or the lack of policies, by this administration. And I will tell you, everybody is paying that tax. Working people have a very great difficulty. You have to pay 40 or 50 bucks to fill up your gas tank. You're gonna have, where are you going to cut? Food and rent, what you, you got to cut somewhere. And uh, it's very difficult for the average family. There should be a revolution going on. But if you thought uh, this is an administration that supposedly cut taxes, he's raised tax on all of us through the gasoline. Every time you go to buy pres uh, prescription drugs, especially if you don't have some of the best insurance for yourself or your parents, it's a bush tax. We are paying incredible prices for these, for these uh, prescription drugs, which many people need to survive. There's no reason, no economic reason, of supply and demand that those prices are so high. It's, the, it's just what the market will bear. And they could charge you whatever they want. And it's a bush tax. And people are making decisions now. That they have to uh, they cut their medicine so it's ineffective, or they don't buy food because they're buying their medicine. I mean, this is not an American. We should not tolerate this in America. You get a, 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 a bill from your... Uh, kids who are in college. I, I, I see, I, we've been watching not only Bill, but then his kids play in college, uh, giving us all. By the way, when Bill Walton graduated UCLA, which was in the midst of the uh, Vietnam turmoil, he, he, didn't believe, he didn't think that just because you're an athlete, I don't have any opinions. He said what he thought about Vietnam and helped people understand, and we, th we thank you for that, and you continue at least to, it's hard to be in sports and have a political position. But we, th we uh, appreciate that you're outspoken this at times, Bill, so thank you. Uh, but every time you get a tuition bill from your kids, your kids through now? Are they all through? Got one left? No. <laughs> all right, good. Your tuition is out of sight. Many middle class families can't afford it. We've cut loans, we cut uh, grants. I mean, that's a bush tax. We, kids have got to go to college to participate in our economy. So wherever you look, the middle class is getting squeezed. And people should be riled up, but the opposition party has not shown the leadership to get people to, to be, understand what's going on, and then to take action that will help them, to help us change things. If you remember, the, whether you're talking about civil rights or uh, talking about uh, the Vietnam War, Congress didn't take the lead in those things, to either end the war or to have uh, voting rights. It was people who, many times in the streets, at least, you know, taking action, uh, direct action, 
in protests and marches and other things that uh, force the government to respond. I think we have to do that today. I don't, I don't see the parties uh, either uh, uh, taking the leadership to tr try to figure out how do we get out of the mess that we're in. Uh, I mean, we're in a microcosm right here in San Diego. It's all about leadership. <laughs> These things are not impossible either. We should not have gotten into them, but to, to get out of them, it takes leadership. And I, I frankly don't see that happening uh, in, in San Diego and or the national, the national level. The Democratic Party is, is being, all, uh, I saw our, our, uh, our chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Howard Dean, who I supported for president. He went on the John Daly show a few months ago. Everybody see him? Anybody see that show? <laughs> Watch it, 11 o'clock, comedy station. The best analysis of the news <laughs> that we have today. Fake news is still the best news. And, uh, you know, uh, he doesn't let anybody off the hook. He, uh, he uh, the, uh, John uh, Stewart on that show asked Howard Dean, well, if you took over tomorrow, what would change? What would you do? And Dean said something about fiscal responsibility. Nothing about gas, nothing about health care. National health care is, is, is a policy that we could talk about. Education is a policy uh, we ought to be repeal No Child Left Behind and help, and help uh, school districts with what we know works, whether it's small classes or new buildings or teacher salaries or professional development or parent outreach. We know what works. We can educate every kid. It's a question of, of supporting those, those uh, efforts that do that. But no, we want to test every year and throw out and say every, everybody doesn't uh, do well on those tests, including people who don't speak English or have other special uh, uh, problems, that we're just going to call them failing. We, should, we have an answer to that. We have an answer to the health care crisis. We have an answer to environmental protection that doesn't just say, you name a, a, a bill, healthy uh, forest, and then clear cut all the forest, as, as the Republicans did. Uh, and one of the most uh, hypocritical things is the way tr veterans are treated today. Our president says, support our troops, support our troops, support our troops. But when they come home, we don't support them. Not only do we have a greater percentage of amputees and, um, and uh, spinal cord injuries than we've had in any war before because of our medical uh, advances, but we, we know the mental issues that, that, that soldiers involved in combat have. We summarize it with calling it PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's an incredibly debilitating situation, taken out on spouses, on kids, on society. Uh, people uh, don't understand some of the, the things that are going on in their life and why they respond with violence, but we know how to deal with it. But it takes resources. <laughs> it takes people who do counseling, it takes outreach to families so they understand what's going on, and we ain't doing it today. When the Vietnam kids came home, not only didn't we welcome them as heroes, but we didn't know anything about, or didn't want to know anything about mental health problems. And half the, vet, half the homeless on the streets today, tonight, will be veterans of Vietnam. That was, that's no way to treat those people. So the, the Democratic Party has answers, but we have to communicate them better, get them out to the, uh, to the public. I think we should be out of Washington doing this. Our, our leadership right now cares only about the debates within the House and Senate rules. Now, there are a few junkies who watch C-SPAN, I'm sure, here. <laughs> but most people have no idea what goes on there. It doesn't seem to matter with them. The way we argue about things and the motions we make are not leadership. But that's what our party, my party, is doing as leadership, saying, let's debate them. Uh, Newt Gingrich understood that if you play by the, play by the rules that the majority sets up, you aren't going to win. He changed the rules. And I think it's time to neuter the party, the Democratic Party. That's N-E-W-T. <laughs> that is, don't play by the rules that they set up. You can't win. He understood that. I'll just give you one minor example, and then I'll end. Many of you, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to just tell you one anecdote on, about the, the House, and many of you are very informed, but I bet you didn't know these, these exact details. When we voted last year on the budget of the United States, it's two and a half trillion dollars. It's a lot of money. We were given the budget three hours before the vote, 1,300 pages. It was this high. Now, nobody, Republican, Democrat, could actually read that, right? We didn't know, nobody knew what was in it. And they said, 
Here it is. Let's have a vote. The Democratic Party was given a half hour to debate. <clears throat> We're not allowed to amend anything. And so we lost, obviously, the vote because they have the majority. Well, you probably didn't read anything about that. You don't know, the, I mean, it's a prostitution of the political process, the way it was done. And they, I can multiply that a thousand times. I try to get our party to say, look, let's just walk out on the House steps with our 1,300 pages. Let's go read the budget. Where would the TV cameras be? On us. But more important, it's not just a gimmick. We could talk about the failures of the budget because all the cameras that we had. Now, that, that's how Newt would have handled it when he was in the minority. And he built a political party. I don't, believe, I don't agree with it, but he built a political party that had a uh, set of ideas, it had uh, uh, funding mechanisms, it had uh, think tanks, it had uh, uh, candidates that were groomed for things. I mean, he really set up a party that took over in 1994. We're not doing that. Uh, so a little, a little gimmick like that could have enormous impact. But our guy said, no, we've got to debate them and the rules that were set up. That's just, you're making fun of the House. Well, there is no House when you do what, the, what they did to the, to the procedures. And they change the rules whenever they want. I mean, the majority party can change the rules under which we, we go. So I believe we should change the rules. I mean, I mean, don't play by their rules. Get out to the nation. Talk about the gasoline prices. Talk about health care. Talk about education. This is what everybody talks about around their dinner table. One last thing. What's wrong with the people in this nation? Not only what's wrong with the Congress. Uh, these are issues that people should be making noise about. And I don't mean that you have to necessarily march and go to jail, although we might get to that again. I mean that you have to utilize the structures that are available to us in this democracy. And I still think it's the greatest democracy in the world. And we have ways to influence our, our brothers and sisters. A simple thing like letter to the editor. I read about 100, 150 different publications every week. Not only the, you know, the Union Tribune and the uh, Chula Vista Star News, but there are weeklies and month, monthlies, church, church bulletins and neighborhood uh, kinds of newsletters and uh, ethnic uh, communities papers and labor union newsletters, all those. You could put a letter to the editor and all that. I read the letters to the editor before I ever read my letters to the congressman that you're supposed to write. Because I know not only are it represents the views of a lot of people, but lots of people are reading that stuff. You can influence public opinion. The TV stations give you public access for editorials. I mean, we could start utilizing all this uh, much more apparent, much more than we do. I believe that uh, that right now we are acting like the frogs I talked about, but I believe we should jump out of that tepid water and tell Washington that we are not meeting the needs that you have every single day. And this Congress will respond to that. Thank you very much.